Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. I want to preach a sermon called, I Married You. Praise the Lord. James chapter 4 verse 7. You there you say, I mean. Common scripture. Many people begin from resist the devil and he will flee from you. Praise the Lord. Jesus, we thank you. We pray that you will speak to us today. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will. You don't first resist and then you what? You first submit and then you what? The devil. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. If a man's submissions are questionable, his resistings are questionable. Praise the Lord. If a man can't sort out their submissions to God, are you listening to me? His resistings will sort him out. There are people who live a life of love, sickness, wanting, battles, and all these kinds of things. And they ask God for a lot of things. They ask for answers. They ask God for breakthrough. They ask God for deliverance. One time on another campus, I preached about repentance. Praise the Lord. And there was this young girl who kept a certain woman on her heart for years. And at the same time, she used to ask God, for tongues because she wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in that someone she actually realized she had not forgiven. Praise the Lord. And before she had not forgiven, she left a foothold. Paul calls it a foothold for the devil. Praise the Lord. Paul says if we don't move in forgiveness or if we have unforgiveness and bitterness, we create a foothold for the devil. Whether you're in the grace or you're the law. Mark 11, chapter 24. I want to show you something. It says, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have. And many a time we rush to that and make men understand how it is that whatsoever things they ask for, or whatsoever things they desire when they pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And I always tell people, the difference between exegesis and exegesis, the difference between drawing out the meaning of the scripture and a man giving their own opinion about what they think the scripture is, or me, is this. Let me share with you a mystery. Do we have any architects, graduated architects, who are practicing architecture? Okay, I'll begin this way. What is truth? Many Christians or people in the Christ kingdom, if you want to define truth, many of them define truth as doctrine. Praise the Lord. But if you want to define truth, and you say, what is truth? They will go to doctrine. Righteousness is a gift. That's the truth. Right? But the bigger picture of righteousness, of faith, is that God is righteous. It is in the nature of God to be righteous, before you even define righteousness as faith. You can jungle in the endless lines of trying to prove your point. But the bigger picture is that God himself is righteousness. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now, many people when they want to define truth, eh, they look at doctrine. Those things that Paul calls sound doctrine. And many a time when they get in the doctrine, they conclude that now that is the place of truth. But let me submit to you this. Truth is never and will never be doctrine. 
truth is the nature of God. That instead of a man saying that is true, a man can actually say that is the nature of God. Praise the Lord. When the book of 2 Corinthians 12 speaks of the experiences that Paul had of how he went up in the third dimension of the Spirit, let's go there. I just wanted to show you something wonderful. He says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory, but I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Right? Meaning that experience was not only a place of vision or God just to expose to Paul that he was God, but there was a place of revelation in the experience that Paul had. Right? Next line. And it says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, where in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. But such an one caught up to the heart, third heaven. Are you hearing me? Next line. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out in the body, I cannot tell, God knows. Next line. How that he was caught up into paradise and had unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for man to act. He didn't say it wasn't easy. He only said it wasn't lawful. Meaning, there were laws on the earthly plane that could not allow him to articulate heavenly experiences. Meaning, like men out on the earth, there are laws that allow men to act. And it is that there is a law in the spirit that allows a man to speak. When Paul says our conversations are in heaven, there are spiritual laws that allow a man to speak and communicate by the spirit. Praise the Lord. That that man, if he tries to speak the very language on the earthly plane, the Bible says, it is unlawful for men to act. Meaning, it can only take a place of the spirit for a man in that particular order and grace to articulate, to speak forth. It meant if Paul had to give you an explanation of the experience, he needed to take you in a realm where it was lawful. Are you hearing me? Therefore, like it is acceptable for certain things to be done and said on the earth, so it is acceptable to be done and said in the heavenly place. Praise the Lord. Like there are laws that govern the earth, there are laws that govern the heavenly. Heaven does not define truth by doctrine. Heaven defines truth by the nature of God. That's why I was looking for an architect. Huh? If you've hung around architects for some time, when they are validating a man's work or proving what has been done, I hear me? Many of them used to move with plumb lines. Those things which are perpendicular to the ground. Okay? And they are all leveled by 90 degrees. Why? Because the law on the earth's surface is simple. Gravity pulls everything to the center of the earth. The substance of gravity is that anything that is laid on ground to rest can rest if all the figures around it give it enough support but it's most accurately supported at 90 degrees. Anything beyond 90 degrees will need a different kind of effort, exercise a particular direction for it to stand. Is that true? Now, many architects have a language, and I've seen architects and construction engineers when they put plumb lines on the building. Listen, they always ask, is that building true? Isn't it? They use the word, is that building true? Meaning, does it succumb to the laws of the earth? Gravity, once this line at 90 degrees, is it truly 90 or there is something missing? You don't go now into vain jangling of the doctrine of explanation. Okay, we put the angle at 93 degrees, but you see even if the angle is 93 degrees, there is a fix that can hold the pole quite enough to a particular degree. That the exerted pressure, because of having lost direction, can be present, but this thing could still be standing in a certain way. So, 90 degrees, okay, no. The architect asks a simple question. Is the building true? Is it subject to the laws? So it is with the scriptures. Anything that you say and preach, right, should and must be realigned to spiritual laws. But if you float those laws, it doesn't matter whether you're in the grace or you're in the law, you float it the rules. Tell your neighbor, I married you. Now, let's go back to Mark eleven twenty four. The Bible says, whatsoever things a man desires when you pray, he says, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. It is okay. Right? For a man to use that statement and preach it and give impression and give everything that you must give to make sense. Right? But what makes scripture true is when a man gets to 
the very place and looks for the context and tries to understand what was the spirit of God looking for in both painting the nature of God and what makes certain statements true. By reason of writing and allocation of reference, yes, they will use chapters and verses. But you realize that Mark 24 and 25, by the original, were not necessarily to carry what? Verses. So let's go. He says, therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Next line. And when you stand praying, did you hear that? He says, whatsoever things you desire, you desire them, you shall have them. But when you stand praying, forgive. If you have owed anything, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you, whether you're in the grace or you're in the law, that's what makes whatsoever true. Praise the Lord. That's why now James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee. Why did I want to intentionally preach a sermon called, I married you? Many Christians don't understand that the marriage they have with God is them and God. You understand what I'm saying? And I need to make this fact clear to us. Right? You might minister with people who don't understand you. You might minister with people who might never understand you. Right? You might minister with people who you're hard to. You might minister to people who can interpret you. You might minister to people who might not interpret you. Right? You might minister to people who will appreciate you. You might minister to people who might never appreciate you. But whether they did or they didn't, God is married to you. Are you hearing me? That the place of maturity is no longer the not doing certain things because somebody did some to me. But the place of maturity is even if they did this stuff to me, I will still do the right thing. Why? Because my submissions are to God. I married you. Yes, God didn't marry you and your sister. He did not marry you and that guy next to you who pisses you off every other day. God married you. Whether they understand you or they don't, he married you. You owe a kind of explanation to the God that you submit to. Whether you want it or not, whether you understand this or you don't understand it, the secret is this simple. He married you. Yes. God, they piss me off. I don't feel like talking to them. But you see, yes, they pissed you off. But by reason of your submission to me, I married you. Do what? Talk to them if you must. Love them if you must. Forgive them if you must. Why? Because the business is between me. I married you. I didn't marry them. Are you hearing me? Anybody outside this case become anything. You can even produce a child and the child becomes unruly. Are you hearing me? But you're not going to leave your husband because your child is fine. You're not going to become unseeming because everything around you doesn't make sense. That is the maturity that takes a man to the satisfaction that regardless of whatever happens in your life, you owe God a submission. Then now a man starts to do things not because they like doing them, but because they married God. Praise the Lord. Where you get to a point and say, I have forgiven you. Not because I like you so much. In fact, I still don't like you. But when I got married to this guy, I made vows. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? And every other time I revisit these vows, I hear him. There was a vow that told me I forgave you. Right? And that vow has told me always forgive me. Whether you want it or not. Yes? There are people you forgive and never have peace with. In the sense of they might never want to see you, you might never see them. Yes, that's okay. But still forgive. Why? Because in the marriage vow, he told you, you shall forgive like I forgave you. Whether you want it or not, you shall forgive like I forgave you. I've been in instances where I've seen ministers of God by reason of comfort zone. I hear him. And the seeking to please many have gotten to a point of even twisting their message. To fit a particular name. Are you hearing? But I want to commit to you. It doesn't matter how much or whatever you do. Always remember. He married. You should have said I'm not going to get born again. That would have meant that you and God didn't have a relationship. But the moment you enter the relationship with our personal Lord and Savior. You owe him some explanation. You just have to owe him something. 
Are you hearing me? And the place of a man maturing to knowing that I no longer need to do certain things because I need to please some people. I no longer need to do certain things because I must appear among the number. Are you hearing me? I married the guy. Are you hearing me? Oh, so to speak, he married her. Are you hearing me? There are things in our lives that will never make sense. There are things in our lives that we might never find the satisfaction with. You will screw up in life. You will do stuff you don't even expect to do. You will go to God every night and say, God, I'm sorry. Are you hearing me? And then you go back and do it again. And then go back at this time, I'm sorry, times two. And then you bold and underline, italicize it. Are you hearing me? And then you still come back through the same flaws. Are you hearing me? But he married you. Are you hearing me? If people never understood the ministry of the love of God toward us, we will never see deliverance in the body of Christ. How many people have been pushed into guilt corners? Eh? To a point where they feel either Christ divorced them or he doesn't want to do anything with them. Are you hearing me? That a person can even look at you and start judging you by your life and say, Ah, that person I have noted for so long and I can tell you this one thing. That woman is A, that brother is B, that cousin is C. Whatever they say, you married him. He married you. The business is between you and God. Are you hearing me? The satisfaction should be that you have done what you have to do for your husband. Praise the Lord. In this instance, it's hard for the man to register, but you can register it there. Because with God, things are possible. Praise the Lord. Let me show you something in Song of Solomon. Praise the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 9. He says, I have compared them, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariot. It's like, and I cheeks are comely with rose, and when you go down and read, you'll actually realize that the experience of Solomon in relationship with the one that he loved, okay? Not necessarily your perverse understanding, but in relationship of the one that he loved. Praise the Lord. He had to take time and value who he married. Are you hearing me? And value who he married and say, okay, this God is this, right? But I know that this is good and this is wonderful and this I can do and this I can eat and this I can take. Now, even in all this comparing, I can relate him to this thing and I cannot relate him to this thing anymore. This is a Christian with a personal relationship with God. Are you hearing me? This is a Christian with a personal relationship with God. Why am I saying this whole comparing thing? I want you to understand that when a man grows in God, you start to realize that there are certain things that just can't compare to the God you marry. Do you understand, Brandon? One time a woman came here in church crying. She said, I ended the relationship. Why? I just don't know. It. I just feel I need God. You understand? Eh? Now, it was painful for her to walk out of a love relationship of a person she really loved with her own heart. And anybody can understand unless you're the devil. Eh? But what led this young woman to compare God and this guy and then she chucks him without thinking twice. Yes, the pain is there. And that's it. Yes. But she married him. <laughs> well, you understand what I'm trying to tell you. That the comparisons of God could create a particular value that you attach to your master. That is why I tell people, the moment you learn to submit yourself to a particular thing, because you're in a marriage thing, are you hearing me? And for those of you who have not counseled, you don't even know a half of what I'm talking about. You can look at some people and ask yourself, why is she still in the relationship? Some of them is just beds and roses, but there are people who are in marriage and then you just listen to half a story there's this woman one time who came to me like six or five years ago huh? this guy would beat her and beat her and cut her and she bleed and then she goes to the hospital right and then the next day she's back home now lawyer girls are saying she she out huh? oh. <laughs> whatever lawyer what time they say this girl might be out of her me you beat me you By the time a man lays a hand on me, 
Hell break loose. <laughs> Hell break loose. Even the suspicion that he might slap her is enough to pack her back. Suspicion. I suspect, I had the feeling you might want to harm me. <laughs> Are you hearing me? And then this woman, they would beat her. Eh? Now, of course, if she meets the legal kind, sue him. And people used to advise Munaj. And then, and then, and then, the coach can put something on him where he can start to meet some dues and then you're good. Are you hearing? And then she would say, <laughs> and then the next day she's in the same house. Now when I was a kid, I used to think she's stupid. Because I was a babe. Are you hearing? Until later God shows me the bigger picture. She married him. And on that ground she said, for oh, we don't say what's for us here, right? But they say for what? For us will never have worse days. Say amen. She said for better for us. Like this relationship in salvation. You're entering it for better. For whether they stress you in ministry, it's for better. You married. See that to Wayakala to one to be in the moon. One to take a dent and bag up where it's you even walk and say, Ah, me salvation. But you married Jesus. They used to beat her. And then one day, she tells me, Grace, if I was not married to this man, I would have left. Test her way. Now the point is marriage. Now, of course, when you're reasoning like a human being, you can reason that. Right? And then she said, when she married the man, actually she married the Muslim, Five, six years ago, many years, I don't even know where she is. When she married the man, eh, she knew he would do all these things to her. She just had the feeling he would be that kind of person, right? Some of you think when Jesus fell in love with you, he first saw how faithful you were in tithe. The overnight she went to those bujins that got dirty because you got slain. That revelation you typed on Facebook, not. <laughs> the Bible says, while you are yet sinners, Christ loved you. Are you hearing me? Now I'm talking to people who still have guilt consciences. You think you'll never forgive yourself. You think you're worse than what? You even want to hang yourself. You don't even know how you'll pick up your pieces. Listen. Praise the Lord. The God that entered that relationship with you knew how far you could go. Are you hearing me? Man, and he still loves you, yes, with an everlasting love. If you want the sample, go back to the story of Hosea. The Bible says he gets the woman out of prostitution, brings her back home. Are you hearing me? Two days she's going back. Now I am thinking again. You get out of this house and then you say, <laughs> ah. But the majority of many African women, they will know by now, majority of their fathers had strange women, and their mothers never packed. And all over a while, now that's when we realize by the book of Proverbs, there were strange women. That's why if you're here and you're second woman, listen, to God you're strange. I'm sorry, I'm not going to make it straight or the other way. To God you're strange. You're not a second woman married to Adam, no. You are a strange woman in a relationship of a man and woman, God knows. There you can stun me like you want. Are you hearing me? But God doesn't marry three, right? It is two. Otherwise, the devil should have been his prostitute. Hey, are you hey am I making sense? Now, for some people who are Africans here, you've seen instances where your father has got strange women. At one time I was counseling a woman and said, <laughs> She packed her box. Me, I'm going. She carried, you know, those things of scaring. You see, preconceived concepts can create a particular idea and blow certain things out of proportion. I was telling people a story. A drunk man was in a taxi. So a guy robbed his wallet. So he reaches the time to pay. He checks. 
wale tutaji kola chi Azuri na nanga wale tiangi He doesn't feel his what his wife He says now let me speak loud Anybody that stole my wallet What happened when they stole my wallet in 1996 it's going to happen again You hear that kind of thing I'm speaking categorically to whoever took my wallet What happened in 1996 when they stole my wallet is going to happen again The guy on the chair thought things <laughs> Did he bewitch the guy with the wallet is the guy mad on the street Of course you can imagine a million things The guy slowly threw back the wallet He says, oh, oh, sorry, I found my wallet, it's here. The drunk guy did what? Found his wallet. So out of curiosity, some passenger asks, Nene Sebo, what happened in 1996? The drunk guy said, I walked for three hours up to home. You get, but the preconceived thought of whoever stole my wallet. Oriente mabeka ali ali alooza uwaleti bwe batipa baamuloka na zimbo olubuto yafa Kali kali ne mabeka mutu The guy has walked for up to home He was going to walk again <laughs> My dear sister came with a grace I am through And I looked at this couple and I realized they were born again Christians with a reputation in our people. I imagine things who are they inspiring they they have people they have inspired thee she has set a record in their family she was the first one to get married thee biwangu byo nano biroza mbo chinoka katunda kakati sabaliyo who are the ones who are the masumba kwa kama chitu twachiri munyo how you see If you submit to this ministry, listen, you can't shame us. Tumera yo tuta mugundi ya CDM how? Ha ha. And then they show me on the Kwanjula video. Praise the Lord. So I thought a lot of things. Right? It was painful. Something had gotten on the man. You see the Bible says that a strange woman's house inclines to death. They don't speak about the physical house. They speak about the spiritual house. Thing lines to death. It kills. It has a kind of killing thing on the man's spirit. So the guy was like a dead guy and for those women who have had men who cheat, they be like they are bewitched. He can't stop. And the way you pray it's as though he's worsening. Check it out. Until they get to a point where they say that is na bilekera mukama, oh bajja, batakoma wo basura yo. Praise the Lord. So they go to that point. So of course she said I'm going to pack her. We all got scared. And we waited for her to pack next day. One month she has not packed. Two months the guy is worsening but she has not packed. Three months. Yeah, hey, after that I'm seeing her again heavy with child ningamba manu. Me I'm going back wa second born. I hear him. He speaks to She married him. She married him. That's what the Bible says God detests divorce. Why? She married him. I even saw a worst case scenario at Kawempe Health Center when I was doing my internship there. They checked the man and he was HIV positive. Checked the woman she was negative. And then we are thinking we are giving post test counseling to a couple that is discordant and advising safer ways of doing their own business without necessarily affecting each other. And we're going through the drill. So I think now you know condoms. Uh, you know what can't The man said, "What me I want?" I said, "No. There should be some madness between your mind." Because you see, I explained the whole story. They mean no. And I asked her why. She told me, "One, I'm born again." <laughs> I'm sorry. 
I'm not saying do it. I'm only telling you it happened. She told me I am married, and then I asked her. So? She asked me, do you know I suspected this guy would be sick? And I told her, okay, and what was in your head? She said, well, I looked at the woman. I want her to sit down and then she teaches me. It looks scientifically, hypothetically, inexcusably, socially, communally, familially, stupid. But she married him. The next thing I know, she says, me, I'll live with my husband the way I've been. I told the man, if you ever cheat on this woman, you're stupid. <laughs> if you ever. I mean, I've never seen anything like that. The affairs of you having married, or gotten married to God, mean that you can risk anything, including your life. That there was Pastor Zach discussing people who don't want to do certain things in the gospel because they're protecting their name. Because a name is all a man has. Listen, when you get married, you lose your name. Why? Because he did what? He married you. He married you. It's you and God. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. When a man matures to that understanding, you can risk anything for the sake of the gospel. You can do things that people don't understand or don't even expect you to do. Momuntu yakala mukuba punch no opening a arm. Nako na ina ka yakala kunkola. You understand? Why? Because by normal understanding, how could you be smiling with me when I pissed you off last June? You understand? But the maturity that you're married to a man who you owe self submission to, you will love me. You will forgive me. You will bless me regardless. Are you hearing me? They might add pain on your labors. They might add more sorrows on the labors. But you're not married to them. You're married to a man who you promised to submit to all the days of your life. At that rate, any devil can leave. Why? When you talk about the love of God, the Bible says, Corinthians 13, 8, this love. Let's go there. It says, love never fails. Some things fail and people fail because they are not established in the love of God. They're established in boyfriend, girl. The Bible says, charity never fails. But whether there be prophecies, give me the amplifier. He says, love never fails. It never fades out, becomes obsolete, or comes to an end. As for prophecy, the gift interpreting the divine will and purpose, it will be fulfilled and pass away. As for tongues, they will be destroyed and ceased. As for knowledge, it will pass. It will lose its value and be superseded by truth. Are you hearing me? But it told you, this love never fails. It is the relationship that you carry with God. How do I know that everybody born again will go to heaven? God can't fail to get you there. If you still think it's under your terms, like a man who has caught in the scriptures of the experiences of the tribulation. You remember the story of Jesus at the Mount of Olives? where he speaks of how men shall endure till the end to be saved. Men who are left before the rapture. If your faith is that you might stay after the rapture, are you hearing me? Endure till the end for your salvation. But if your faith is that you'll be caught up, are you hearing me? Your issue of endurance is, it's not even a question anymore. Why? Because your salvation is so clearly cut. The Bible says he has given you an eternal salvation. God has not saved you in the earth. Neither can you be corrupted in the earth. God has saved you in eternity. And the devil can't tempt in eternity. I wish some of you understood this. The devil can't go past us and then enter eternity and then destroy the gift of salvation on a man. But how many things, even recently I was hearing on radio, hey, go to Why? Because the man of God thinks that sin still has power on a Christian. If it does, then I will articulate that Jesus died for nothing. That's what the Bible says. That's why Paul says, Me, I don't frustrate the grace of God. 
For if it's of works, then Christ died for nothing. Christ died for nothing. If you think your works are taking you to heaven, work for the glory. And then the immature spirit says, and then another one learns it without necessarily truth. Why? I told you what truth means. Huh? Is it responsive to the nature of God as to the spiritual laws of interpretation? Or you're on the earthly laws? That's what I stand to tell people. Anybody that interprets from the earthly plane is just that dimension. It's not wrong. It's just that dimension. Let the things of the earth teach us of the things that are in heaven. Everything on the earth is that dimension. We live in a three-dimensional world. If everything on the earth teaches you of the things in heaven, you can only learn of the heavenly things again by spirit, again to only three dimensions. Are you hearing me? But there are four dimensions. There are five dimensions. The fourth dimension is time. The wisdom of God teaches a man to function beyond the dimension. Why? And let me teach you the secret. Every human mind can only interpret whatever it has in the earthly plane by what it sees. Or what prior knowledge it has about that thing. If you took this thing to a place where they've never seen mobile phones, they might not even know it's a mobile phone. They'll say it was something. And they'll try to draw it in their own picture. But whatever they're drawing in their own picture is what they call human idea. Let me tell you why the church is so separated, even in the issues of doctrine. I've had people who define identity in the gospel. Identity. The, your identity in God. Your identity. Right? But after that someone, many a while when they were raising men in a certain particular order, you realize that they pushed men to denomination. Not Christ the identity. Denomination is the human effort by human ideas to define the gospel, right? And after defining the gospel, right, they draw a particular group of belonging because of what they think is right according to scripture. Right? And if there are denominations in the body of Christ, this is a denomination. Are you watching? This is a denomination. This is a denomination. This is a denomination. Right? According to a human mind, everybody can say, okay, this one is more useful because it's the Bible. Take the Bible and leave me with nothing. This one, for if somebody says, ah, me, I need a phone because I need to. You understand? Everybody interprets whichever way they want. But if you are to look at these things in the eyes of God, God doesn't know anything that divides. He doesn't know any denominator in his body. That's why Paul used the language that there might be no schism. The body of Christ cannot be divided. But how many things have been dividing the Christian church because of these contentions that we have around doctrine, thinking that doctrine is actually the standard of truth. And then we realize actually doctrine and truth were two different things. That is why the church of God has to grow to the nature and understanding. It is not about Baptist Pentecostal, a man like John Wesley with his anointing. He raises dead bodies, blah, 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 blah. And after that when he dies, all the guys who come after that, ah, the proponents to carry the move forward, only carry the word Methodist. The methods John Wesley used to sustain ministry. And many learned of the man's methods, but they never learned of the man's spirit. Men are so denominated in their own understanding that a man would die to support what he thinks is right. But without necessarily the standard, which is the nature of God. That's why many of them can't demonstrate God. They can demonstrate technical polemics. They can debate the gospel up to tomorrow. They can actually speak until you drop, but they cannot demonstrate. Paul says this gospel is not mere talk. It is power, mighty to say. When you look at how men define love in the gospel, for example, everybody thinks, and the Bible says all the ways of a man seem right. But I'll tell you this one thing. When a man has understood agape, the revelation of that is simple. Nothing and nobody can fail you. The moment you enter that marriage relationship with God, nobody can fail you. And if you choose to help anybody, anybody can change. Anybody can change. I have grown to understand that anybody by the love of God can change. 
But you must show your lines of your submissions and the God you submitted to and the vows that you made when you accepted. You say, I accept you as my personal Lord. He has Lordship over you. Even if you don't feel like it, he has the Lordship. How many people in this marriage with God do what they feel they want to do? They know it's wrong, but they want to do what they feel they want to do. Praise the Lord. Some people's services are optional. Choir is optional. Are you hearing me? Prayer is optional. I'm sorry I can come on this day, but I can't come on this day. I can pray on Saturday, day, but I'm not there. Yeah. Listen. You married God. Get beyond the issue of thinking that anybody will lose out. You cheat yourself. You don't cheat anybody. Are you hearing me? Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? It's like couples that you've heard of who say, and that woman says, he doesn't give me time, right? He is her husband. He ought to give her time. If your time with God is your brother standard, me, I'll meet you on Saturday evening. That's okay. But you married him. Are you hearing me? You are in a relationship with him. Even if you become unfaithful, for him he will stay what? Faithful. He will love you. He married knowing who you are, right? But that love of God inside you should actually lead you to know. It should teach you better before they even ask you, why didn't you sing on Saturday? No, this thing you have with him. I hear me. Some people use that for excuse to say, I'm answerable only to God. Yes, you're answerable to God. And that's okay. But never forget, he married you. You married him. He says, I married you. I didn't marry the choir leader, whether you're going to lead worship that day or you're not. God will always raise another to lead. Bottom line is, he married you. You owe him some kind of submission. One time I called somebody and said, why didn't you pray me? For some reason, actually, I don't know. I didn't have a reason. <laughs> you understand? Eh? And it's wrong to say because they don't pray, they don't have a relationship with God. That's also being also funny. I can't say that because somebody didn't come to church, right? So therefore, they don't have a... Ah, some people be there and they're in caves. And then they come and raise dead bodies. It's possible. Are you hearing me? It's what? Possible. It's also wrong to judge a man because they didn't attend service and then you think, well, they don't. Again, it goes back to you and God. You. You with you. The two of you who got to marry. It's your business. Are you hearing me? If you will preach the gospel, you're married. If you refuse to preach the gospel, it's up to you. If you choose to love God and men, love them. If you don't want to love them, it's up to you. This is a marriage affair between the gospel of affiliation has come to an end. Those are my things of me, I belong to the other ministries. What? The two of you have vows. Before you even answer about to me, and I'm sorry because sometimes we also can push this thing of submission too far. That's why I say I'm sorry. Before you even explain to me, you have a guy you married. He's called God. First, have contentions clear between him and you. Don't lie to God. This is forever. Are you hearing me? And he searches out everything about you. So on both ends, as of to what you will do because you're in a relationship toward God and what you must pay as a price toward men. Always have this understanding. I am married to God. Some of you will get to a point where you're going to start preaching the gospel like we have. And you're going to be so persecuted. The other day a man came to my office just to tell me how much a certain man in Kampala hates me with a passion. Because he had me one time tell people the grace of God suffices. He got so annoyed. He got so annoyed that his ministry is just to go about Kampala preaching about a certain guy called Grace. And his ministry is just toward me. And the guy looked at me and said, Grace, I really feel sorry for you because this guy really doesn't love you. I told him, brother, I married God. Whether they want us preaching the grace or they don't want us preaching the grace, my submission to the man was in that vow. I told him, I will preach his gospel. Some of us, we just didn't wake up to preach because we saw a wonderful preacher on television or because 
we were inspired in a certain direction. Let me tell you, the gospel some of us preach, we were not taught by men. No man taught me this gospel. Are you hearing me? I was in a love relationship with that man when he started to teach me. Where nobody was. Now, I owe him some kind of explanation. If I should twist my message to please you, or in any sense, carry a certain kind of grief because I'm not preaching what you want me to preach. I am married to God. Not you. Now, it might sound proud, but that's the truth. That's why Paul says when we submitted our gospel, we did not allow certain men to creep in and rob us of our freedom. Why? Because there are some people who will seek to put you in order only to rob you of the freedom you have in God. As some are telling people a story about Constantine. Constantine entered a relationship with church. But never did they know that church was going to have another extramarital affair besides the God they married. 300 years ago. And the simple instance was this. He recited the same vows. 300 AD. He tells them, I am a Christian. And then he called all the laities, the elders of the church during that time. 300 years AD. Because at that point, the church of Christ was unpredictable. I was telling the story to some people. It was unpredictable. Are you hearing me? And remember, during that time, the Israelites were under Roman rule. Again, so the deal was simple. We want to bring everything Christian to the government. Everybody claps. We will go with your morals. If you say it's wrong to eat pork, we will not eat it. If you say it's wrong to steal, we will not steal. If you say it is wrong to marry more than one wife, we will not marry more than one. They coded every law of Rome subject to the scriptures in the Bible. But Constantine told the leaders during that time and told them one thing, but only one thing. There's a group of people who don't hail Caesar as king. Put them in order and in line to understand that even if they love God, they still Caesar above them. And the church entered into that relationship. And from then on, slowly but surely, the exchanges between Caesar and the church were the substitutions of human ideas to create what they think should be church, such that they can predict them through the institution. Now church is so predictable, like it was in the day, that everything that was called scripture and writing, even the simple writing, these things you call writing, one day if I get time I can go through some of these things. I'll give an example, gospel. The word gospel does not exist anywhere in the Greek and Hebrew. But how many people say gospel? The gospel. You understand? If you study, you realize that the word gospel comes from a very ancient English language. It was never Jew or Hebrew or Greek. In fact, it's from the word back in the day. The archaic word was not gospel. It was God spell, G-O-D-S-P-E-L. And the word spell there was, for those of you who knew archaic English, literature student, Shakespeare, spell was story. For you bury me, fairy lady, for this spell. When they used the word spell, they meant story. So, it was more of God's story. God's story. Everywhere you see the word used, so the word gospel in the New Testament, if you go to the Greek translation, the word there has nothing to do with a man telling the story of God. And that's why we miss it. Because a man can use whichever lines he wants to use to quote it. Why? It is no longer God by action ministering to men. It is men by what they feel is combat under that particular time. It's what they feel and what they present. Our reading shall come from. And if you go back now to the line of where it came from by any religious sect, you realize it was pre-programmed that the reading had to come from Luke. This was men's ideas trying to fit institutions into a predicted soul. That even men who preached on the pulpit were not preaching under the unction of the Holy Spirit. They were preaching because the reading had to... Many of you who have preached in such circles, even if you have a message like how, that reading must stand. You can't change it. Even if nobody interprets it, the reading must be there. When you go to the Greek words there, 
you realize that the Greek word that I use for gospel has two words. EU, right? Angelus. Evangelus. Evangelus. And that word borrows two things. It either looks at the messenger, right? With his message. It doesn't separate the messenger with the message. And that's the problem with many of these religious affiliations back in the day when they're sending missionaries. They sent a lot of missionaries to Africa, but many of them had not sent the message along. The instance and testimony of the gospel is not for men to tell God's story. No. The gospel is not just to tell the story of God. Whether men know the story or they don't, he's still God. In fact, the Greek word there for Evangelos is of a man who communicates the true message. And if you go to the deeper root of you, Angelos, it is the testimony of a man proclaiming the kingdom of Jesus Christ evading the earth. That now the communications of men, when Paul used the word, the gospel is not mere talk. It meant the messenger was not necessarily subject to how many words he spoke. To get men converted. Why? Because the messenger carried enough message with him. That before he even spoke, he had the ability to speak without doing. In that realm, Paul would send a hanky to preach the gospel. And it's put on an evil spirit. And a man with sickness is healed. And they ask, how did they get healed? A certain hanky touched one Paul. And then they will come to Paul to give their life to Christ. This is the kingdom of God by Jesus Christ invading the earth. It is deeper than just you narrating the message. It is as you're there, there's a certain realm. In fact, the word kingdom of God there in the Hebrew, the Greek is actually the realm of God. This is the realm of God entering the earth realm. <laughs> this is the realm. This is the realm of God entering the earth realm. That because men have to prove it's fair, they can preach the gospel by anything, that the church will go to a place of looking at a man enough to put them on their knees to confess Jesus without preaching. He will look at a person and a person finds their need for God. Why? Because they are the very testimony of the realm of God into the earthly realm. So, we will stop just talking. That's why in James he defines true religion. And the word there is not actually the Latin word called religion. The word there is actually translated as true worship. God never uses the word religion. Because religion from the Latin, the prefix re, going back, religion, bondage, eon, is a continuous action. Mention, you're continuously acting. Retribution, you're in the act of retributing. Right? Right? So, religion is taking back again a man into bondage right by a particular action so it's actually the action of putting men back to bondage that is religion now James couldn't have used that to put men to bondage the, the Greek word there was actually worship true worship is God has never used the word religion or relationship with men those were ideas of men who submitted themselves to an extramarital affair. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the same thing when we want to only give the story. It's not bad to give story. Eh? It's not bad. But it is deeper than story. We are just deeper than telling Jesus died and rose again, okay? By no. We are bringing the realm of God in the earth. That is deeper. It has a When everybody can prove God to anybody, what can I do that I might be saved is one thing, right? But it's another when a man comes to you and tells you, what can you do that I might be saved? Do you understand? Bring a blind eye. You even start thanking God, Moyaloko said, because you know the eye must open. Moyaloko said, Hayababa, Olaba, Talaba. It's called extramarital. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you do in this life, I want you to know you're married to God. 
He says, I married you. I didn't marry that guy who pisses you off. I didn't marry your seat. No, me, I married you. You all got some kind of submission. When you mature to that, you resist the devil and the devil will flee. Anywhere, whichever way you want, the devil will never beat you. That's why Paul says, brethren, at least we put a footstool for the devil. We're not ignorant of his device. We can't be at a place where the love of God can't work in us. It must work. Listen, grace or law, the love of God must work in you. Why? Because you're married and it never fails. You realize that nothing around you will fail. Praise the Lord. So the Bible says some fall sick and some are dying because they desire not the body. The mere fact that you can't even understand that that person is your brother can kill you. If you want to die early, walk out of life. Praise the Lord. There are certain people you might never change but love them. Certain people who might never understand you, you love them. Certain people who might never understand each other but love them. Praise the Lord. At least you pay your submissions to your husband and let the rest of the things fall in line. Then you see whether people won't change. Why? Because love believes in all things. It hopeth in all things. It vaunteth not itself. It never fails. Praise the Lord. Speak to Jesus. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. The narrow. Make man.